I'm Greg Orham. And I'm Liz Orham. And this is our, our Foothills Foot journey. journey. Where do we begin? I grew up in a, a wonderful, loving home. Church really wasn't on our radar. It was probably in sixth grade when I heard um, how much Jesus loved me, and I actually asked Jesus to come and live in my life. We started off in a traditional Baptist church. I was brought up as a Catholic. I grew up in church. I grew up in... I grew up in... I grew up, actually. I was raised up in church. I was born Catholic. Catholic. Methodist. Baptist. Baptist. Evangelical. I came to Christ in a, a Southern Baptist church. I like to say that my twin sister and I were born in the pew of the church. I actually started going there before I was even born. I did not grow up in church. I had never been to a church in my life. I don't have a spiritual background before Foothills Church. I was a, I think you call them heathens. Yeah, I, I grew up in a, a wonderful, loving home in South Florida, but um, church really wasn't on our radar. Wonderful parents, wonderful family, but just church wasn't part of our lives. I grew up in South Florida. I went to church pretty much every Sunday. Um, it was probably in sixth grade when I heard um, how much Jesus loved me, and I actually asked Jesus to come and live in my life. The problem was, is I heard that if you ask Jesus to come and live in your life, that he will forgive your sins. But nobody ever, ever told me about um, surrendering my life to the leadership or the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So when I got to my early 20s, I started really recognizing that there was something missing inside of me. So I started looking at the Eastern religions and other new age things and those kind of things. and. I just didn't feel like those were answering my questions. Uh, I had met my wife at that time. Greg now became my across the street neighbor, who also, also was my dad's like best friend, I guess. And um, interestingly enough, one day I thought, you know, I think I might want to date this guy. We went out on a date. I asked him because he didn't ask me. So I mean, whatever, you know, I mean, come on. So I asked him on a date. He said, yes, it was a date to come to my parents' house for a leftover New Year's Eve party. We were dating and we were going to get married. And so we, uh, we decided, well, the way you do that is you go to a church and see if they'll allow you to have a wedding at a church, but we didn't go to church. And so um, we went to a church and basically asked the pastor if he would perform a wedding for us. But through our premarital counseling, um, the pastor asked Greg if he was a Christian. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm an American. And I'm like, oh my, I'm like gonna fall over that he actually said this. But anyways, through our premarital counseling, my husband gave his life to the Lord. It was like that light bulb went off and I was like, this is what I've been looking for. And so I gave my life to Jesus. And for the first time in my life, at, at the age of 23, opened a Bible. My wife got me a Bible and, and I couldn't put it down. I was weird reading, I would like, I'd like shake her. It's like, can you believe this is in here? This, is, and I would read it and it's like, wow, this is amazing. And I now was not marrying Greg or him. I was marrying, I think, the Apostle Paul. You know, I'm kind of an, either I'm all in or I'm all out kind of person. So um, uh, you know, we, were, we were all in. You know, it's really interesting because he was so on fire for the Lord and I was so not. And I thought maybe something was wrong with me or him or something, you know, and, and I kept praying, God, what, what's wrong with me? And it was then that I realized that I had Jesus as my forgiver, but I had never asked him to come in my life to be the leader of my life. So I totally surrendered my life to Jesus. And from that point on, 
I'm telling you, my life has never been the same. You know, I knew Greg and Liz, and I, mean, I knew Greg's passion for the gospel. He and I would go stand on the street corner and just tell people about Jesus. We'd, we'd say goodbye to our wives and kids, and they'd go home, and Greg and I would go over to the beach on Singer Island, and we would share the gospel late into the night, and we'd see people come to Christ and pray to receive Christ, and then we'd invite them to come Sunday morning, but the same people we were reaching on Sunday night were not going to darken the doors on Sunday morning to some church. At our church, they had asked if we were uh, interested in helping start a, a, a new church in the area that we were living. We were living about 30 minutes from our church. That church started in our home as a Bible study. We saw a lot of things to do and not to do, learned a lot in that church plant, never even knowing that that's what God was going to have us do here in South Carolina. God was taking Greg, moving Greg and Liz to Seneca. And I, for the life of me, um, I couldn't figure out why would God take my best friend from me? Why, why are you doing this, God? We were teaching a college and career age Sunday school class at the time. And two of the guys that were in our, in our class on Sunday mornings were from Oconee County. And we became very close to those two guys. They were cousins and we came up for both of their weddings. So that's how we got to know Oconee County. And when we looked around, we're fishermen. Like we love fishing. And we saw all these lakes, we're like, holy cow, you know, we need to be there. We're going to retire there. So our plans were, were we're going to retire in Oconee County. Um, little did we know that God had um, plans for us way before retirement. So we came to South Carolina. Shortly thereafter, really felt God's call to ministry. People would ask me prior to that, that I, you know, that I considered ministry. And I always said, no, my business was my ministry. And, and, uh, and I remember, um, saying to Greg, uh, you know what, you know what, babe, you'd make a great pastor. You'd make such a good pastor. And he said, uh, Liz, thanks so much. I will let you know if God's calling and um, he's not. So I didn't pursue it, you know, but I could see it in him, but I guess he didn't see it in himself. She had been saying that all along um, in me. My daughter was best friends with um, our former pastor's daughter. And our former pastor was such a great mentor to my husband. Um, and he always made time for his family. He always did. But for some reason, my daughter said, um, when, we, when we told her, she was in fourth grade, that daddy was gonna be a pastor. And we were expecting her to be like really excited. Um, and she just started crying. And we said, you know, what's, we don't get it, what's wrong? And she said, um, I don't wanna feel left out. I want my dad to spend time with me. And, um, and I, I don't know where that came from because I know that our former pastor always put his family first. So her dad made a promise. He said, I will never put the church before my family. I will promise you that right now. I thought that was a really cool thing um, to share with her. We prayed and we said, well, Let's, let's just kind of see where God leads. And we began this Bible study and I didn't tell anybody in the Bible study what we were thinking. And within a couple of weeks, we had about 30 people in the Bible study. We have known Greg and Liz um, pretty much since we were kids. I grew up with Greg. Liz and I were uh, in the same high school we moved up here, and then two years later, Greg and Liz came. So it was really weird that we both came 14 hours away to the same place. Then the Orhams asked us if we would be interested in coming to their home for a small group. So we just said, sure. So we started going to their small group. We met Greg and Liz just one Sunday morning. They sat right next to us. And when she started talking, I'm like, are you the couple that the pastor was telling us about who, who live in Seneca and da-da-da? And she said, you know, yes, would y'all come to our Bible study in, uh, in our home on Sunday night? So we started doing that. I'd come up and I'd stay with Greg and Liz and, and um, their Bible study going on. And that was that core group of, of men and women. And uh, after a little while, I guess that's when um, God was really speaking to Greg about starting a church. That was the launching place for our hearts 
that God wanted to do something different, wanted to reach the unchurched, but it wasn't going to reach him in a traditional type setting. Greg didn't actually cast the vision of the church. We knew that that was what he was wanting to do, but he didn't cast that vision until we'd been in the group for about eight, nine, ten months, maybe more. God was calling us to plant a church here in Oconee County, and we looked at each other again and said, there's like 200 churches in this county already. What's 201? Gonna, is, is that one church gonna, gonna make a difference? And we just knew, just knew in our heart of hearts that it would. We knew that if God called us to this, that he was gonna do something big, something, something that this county had never, ever experienced. I remember telling my wife, I said, I'm gonna tell the people at the Bible study night what we're thinking and see if anybody's interested in helping begin a church. So that night I said, hey, no pressure, Here's what Liz and I feel like God's calling us to do. We would love for you to take that journey with us, but we don't, you know, if, if God leads you, great. If he doesn't, hey, we're still friends, whatever you want to do. And so out of that group of 30, and that included our kids, there were 17 of us that said, this is what we feel like God wants us to do. Uh, really, there was 17 people in that group. and uh, Counting we, children. Yeah, counting, counting children. Counting children. And I don't know, we may have counted the dog, I'm not sure. <laughs> We just said, let's go for it. And we felt like God was leading and, and that's that's how it began two months later in uh, uh, April of 1998. So we knew that we needed a location. We had two months, I think it was two months. We needed a location, we needed a worship leader, we needed people, we needed the name of a church. We, we literally had nothing, nothing. We had Craig and me and a handful of people. I remember sitting down in uh, their dining room one Sunday and we just, Greg had a, a yellow legal pad and we were just writing down numbers. We need, uh, we need a sound system, we need uh, TVs, we need this and that and the other. We started, I think we came up with $18,000 to, to launch the church. Uh, so everybody started checking their credit cards and things like that. <laughs> we purchased a trailer and we started loading this trailer up with all of the things that we were gonna need for a Sunday morning. And um, Greg said, we have 9,000 toys in this trailer. And I said, well, that's okay, because we're gonna have 9,000 kids one day, you know. Greg was really geared toward trying to start in the elementary school. And uh, we got turned down. And uh, Greg said, well, there's, there's the elementary school and we can't get it. And I remember the guy said, uh, well, let's go for the high school, go for the big one. And Greg <laughs> said, what? <laughs> I had good connections with uh, people at the uh, Seneca High School and I had approached them about us uh, starting a church and meeting because you know it hadn't happened before at least not in this area and they had they were open to it they said sure come on in it was I mean it was not fancy and we were in meeting in the cafeteria of the high school so it wasn't even a you know it wasn't a like an even an auditorium we would get there early and put banners out and um, had to unload the trailer. We had a team of people show up at 6.30 in the morning and we would transform the cafeteria. Move desks around, we had to move cafeteria chairs, you know, the acoustics were terrible, so we were trying to get, you know, good acoustics in there for the band. There was tables set up, we had to take those out and put chairs in, and then when we were done, to just do the opposite. And we were just trying to fix it all up to look like a church, and everybody had to pretty much do a little bit of everything. That was crazy. Okay, it, it, it was it was crazy. It was a lot of work. Um, one of the funny stories that we tell is um, our, our son was probably five at the time. And we lost him. We're like, has anybody seen Cole? Where is Cole? Where is he? And um, yeah, he was locked in the trailer. <laughs> so as we're unloading, I guess he went in and somebody just closed the doors and he was like in there. First attended Foothills back in 1999 first started going to church. Over time we noticed that other people were not taking photographs or doing any video work and I'd always had a passion for that and by default Ruby <laughs> wound up <laughs> being involved in it. Well part of it was sitting on a very tall chair on top of a very rickety box when we were in the first auditorium over here. Um, as a camera operator, that was a <laughs> that was a scary time because it was really kind of shaky. And so we started taking uh, pictures and doing some of uh, the early videos of the church using our equipment that we had and 
Um, as we did that, more and more, more and more people asked, can I have a copy of that or can I see that? And um, it just kept growing from there. I can remember the first Easter and we were standing outside the high school and cars were going by and Liz, Liz Orham was out there and, and a bunch of us were like, oh, please come in here, turn in here. We had some signs out front, you know. We told people we go drive two separate cars so, so it looks like there's a lot of people in here, you know, just put as many cars out. One Sunday we, we would see we, we like, a car would be coming, and we're like, oh my gosh, maybe it's gonna turn in, maybe they're coming, maybe they're coming. And we're like, yes, they pulled in! They're coming, you know, so it, it was crazy. But that was kind of the excitement, that was the atmosphere with everybody there. They were so excited to see what God was gonna do. In the early days of the high school, when we first started, when we launched the church service on, on Easter Sunday of 1998, there were 70 people that came. That included us, all the core group. And, um, the following week, as I like to say, um, you know, due to my great preaching, we, we grew to 35 and we, we literally got cut in half. So, and then the next week we're down to 30 and the next week we're down to 25 and it was like going the wrong direction and I was really nervous. I was afraid that, that, that the original 17 were going to go, we don't see any future in this, we're going backwards, we're, you know, we keep going to this direction where you have nobody. Um, I remember it was the lowest Sunday in attendance ever. Lowest. I think there was like a total of 27 people there. And, um, you know, it could get discouraging, but my prince of a husband, my Greg, never, ever was discouraged. He always knew that God called him to this. And so he's up there and he's preaching like there's 5,000 people there. And as he's preaching, um, you know, he, he, he meets with the team afterwards. He's trying to encourage them and everything. And somebody gives their life to Christ on the day that there was 27 people there. So it just goes to show that God's going to send the people. If you're just faithful to do what God calls you to do, he will send the people. And, um, you know, afterwards, the people are going, the, 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 our, our volunteers, our, 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 our uh, core groups going, I know you were trying to encourage us. Dude, you don't need to encourage us. We're in, we're in all the way. On our refrigerator was this little, um, like a little cardboard handout that Foothills Community Church was um, putting in the newspaper. Well, it hung on our refrigerator for about, I don't know, maybe three months. And one Sunday I said, Tim, why don't we just go here? Our first Sunday there at Foothills was at Seneca High School. Uh, we both graduated from there, so we were familiar with the area and uh, Foothills did a great job just converting a cafeteria into a friendly atmosphere. Back then, in those days, as you were leaving, Liz Orham would be out in the parking lot and if she saw a new face, she'd go up and talk to them and she'd carry her Sunday flyer and she would write down their names and whatever information she could get, you know. You don't see that. You don't see someone that reaches out to try to find out every member's name. Okay, so I was greeting when people arrived I would run from greeting into the side door and be on stage to help lead worship. And then after um, Greg got up to preach, I would head over to kids ministry and serve in there. And then when kids ministry, when he was finished preaching, somebody would like let me know. And then I would run back onto stage to close out the service. And then I would head out the side door to degreet to say goodbye to everybody. And so we went back a second Sunday and as we were leaving the second Sunday, we we're about halfway through the parking lot and Liz comes running with her flyer. Praethers, Praethers. She remembered. I mean, when we came back, she knew exactly who we were. I think she studied her notes during the week and it wasn't just us. It was everyone who visited the church back then. So she, you know, it was just that, that personal stuff that they did that attracted us. And then finally on the third Sunday, we went back and on the third Sunday, I went up to Greg and said, Greg, I can help with sound if you need help. And the next Sunday, I became the sound man for the whole time we were in the high school until we moved into the new building here. It began to grow after that, and it grew at, literally every week, it seemed like we were growing. And at least every quarter, there was growth. We went to two services. We were just running out of room. We knew that the high school was not going to be a long lasting thing. We knew that based on where we were growing, we thought we're going to run out of space at some point. We need to be proactive. There was no venue large enough 
in, in Oconee County to where we believe God wanted us. So we, we thought we had to build something, but we didn't have any land, we didn't have any money, we didn't have anything. And so we, um, we were really fortunate. Somebody had located this piece of property before it went on the market. And we had a very wonderful, gracious family who believed in what we were doing and uh, were, you know, decided to buy the property that we have and then donate it to the church which was a blessing, you know, 55 acres of land and they gave to us. So we started a building campaign. We needed to build a building. And so they were again, stepped up and said, we will match dollar for dollar, anybody, you know, every dollar that's given up to a certain amount. And they made a generous donation. And so we were able to start, you know, constructing the facility. And it was uh, just an amazing thing. I remember the first time they came up with a plan of what the building was going to look like. You were like a first phase, you know, this is going to start at the beginning, you know, we're going to grow from this. So we built the first phase and I remember this, this whole area was like farmland, like cows live across the street, you guys. This is like farmland. And we walked around and prayed and walked and prayed all around this farmland when we got this uh, when we got this property for God to do something amazing and we constructed the the first um, building. So we set up and scheduled a grand opening party on Saturday, November the first, two thousand and three. We ended up getting an oxygen permit on that on Friday. We had no sound no TVs. We had all the stuff we had to get set up by Sunday morning. We thought we were prepared. We were ready. We had a big party out here. A thousand people shows up. First service was so incredible. Greg and Brian rode in on Harley Davidson's. Greg was on the Harley Davidson on that double door. I was on the Harley Davidson on this double door. But I have to admit, watching them come in on the Harleys, this church has not always been, it doesn't do normal. Well, we knew from the beginning that this was not going to be a, an ordinary traditional church. And that's one of the things I love. So we moved here about 18 years ago uh, from Chicagoland in Illinois, and we were getting DirecTV installed. So the DirecTV guy, um, he asked me to go to his, his office, which used to be in Wahala. So I started talking to him. I said, hey, uh, what do you know of a church in Oconee County where there's lots of cars that, that are at the church every Sunday, but people also talk about the church a little bit, you know? Or, and he goes, oh, that's Foothills Community Church right away. He's like, and I go to that church, you know, you want to go there on Sunday. And uh, so he invited me and, and my family and uh, man, that Sunday we came here and we felt like this was home. When I first came to Foothills, it was just totally different than any other church. Um, specifically the message that Greg presented, it was something that you could apply to your life. Growing up, I didn't have that. And I think that's the difference the church has made. It, give, it has given us an alternative we had to end up going into four services. I remember it was a Sunday morning, the crowds, we had people that would pull in the parking lot and leave because there was nowhere to park. We were doing four or five services over there, lickety split, because when people saw we had a building and they're like, oh, they're legitimate now. And the lobby was just cram packed. I mean, people were just bumping up against each other uh, in, in between services. So we knew that the days were coming where we needed to build another facility and we'd only been in two years. And now we're thinking, okay, we gotta do this again. But this time we need to raise a lot more money because we need a much bigger facility. I remember there were a lot of Bible studies in our home and we always, always had an empty chair. Even if their house was filled, we always placed an empty chair, always. Because we said there's somebody else that God's gonna send to fill that chair. There was a Sunday morning, it was so full. And I remember that morning, I, I said to everybody, hey, look around, isn't this great what God is doing? And everybody applauded, it was great. 9.30, we're, we're just filled up. It said the same thing at 11. 100% filled capacity. People standing against the walls. I said, it's amazing, isn't it? Oh, yes, great. And I remember saying, you know, we've got a great opportunity and here's the opportunity. Every single one of us right now, we've got a place. We've got a place to come and worship. We've got a seat. But unfortunately, there are people in this community that don't have a seat here and they won't have a seat here. 
unless we do something that's the most unselfish act we could possibly do. And here's what I'm gonna ask you guys to do. And this is what I said. I said, I'm gonna ask all of us who already have a chair, who already are enjoying what God's doing here. I'm gonna ask all of us to buy a chair for somebody that's not here yet, because we need more room. We need a bigger space. We need room for the next group of people, our neighbors, the people who aren't here yet. Those chairs, the chair campaign worked. Lots of people bought chairs. We ended up um, outgrowing the new building over here where the venue is pretty quickly. So the chairs that we all invested in and bought, they were full. We were doing four or five services over there, lickety split, because when people saw we had a building and they're like, oh, they're legitimate now. He cast the vision for uh, this building and, you know, it's like boom. Uh, the next thing we know, this building was coming out of the ground. And uh, really another significant Sunday was the first Sunday in this building, because all of a sudden we realized, bring them on God, bring them on. Uh, <laughs> we knew we've got room now. We don't have to kill everybody trying to accommodate all the people you're bringing. Uh, so that first Sunday in that, that building there was, uh, it was you know, one that I can remember. Uh, I can almost picture that service. You dream of what it could be, but you know the scripture that says, God gives us more than what we could ever even ask or dream of. That's it, you know, that's it. So um, even though you were in a larger building, there are still challenges. There, are, there will always be challenges, but I believe that through those challenges, it keeps us so humble and so dependent on God. What we celebrate is life change. I mean, not buildings, buildings, are, we, we never were about buildings. We never were about any of the fluff. That's why our building is, you know, a metal building with stucco on it. What matters is who's in the building and who's outside the building, hasn't got in the building yet. And you know, that, that's what we've been about. So it's been a work of God and that's, that's it. I take zero credit for any of it. it it's, you know, God chose to, uh, you know, call me to do it. But, um, you know, he certainly didn't mean, need me to do it. Foothills is the way that transitions between leadership happen. The transition from, you know, from the older generation to the younger generation, you want that to be seamless. Yeah, everything's changing. I mean, the guard's changing. We know the guard's <laughs> changing. I mean, I feel that. I really believe that, that our best days are ahead of us. We've laid a foundation for the next generation of leaders. I grew up actually in church and was in ministry family. My grandfather was a pastor. My dad was a pastor. My brothers, my older brothers are pastors. So I've kind of been around church and, and uh, you know, walk with Jesus pretty much my whole life. I had a friend who, it was, I was in college. It was late night at Waffle House. <laughs> And he said, hey, Katie, you need to come to this young adult group. And it was small town. There's nothing to do in small town. So I was like, okay, I might as well just try out this young adult group. So this guy started it all. He started a young adult group in Tacoa. And I started going just every week and started really just loving the community and loving to be a part of it. And he kept egging me to come on Sundays. He's like, you should come check out a Sunday. You should come check out a Sunday. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And finally I ended up coming and wow, it just blew me away. God just really got a hold of, like, just got a hold of my heart and I loved it. I loved being a part of it. Our friendship grew during that time yeah. and I was not going to date anybody at the church, yeah, especially yeah. being on staff, leading worship. I was like, I just don't, I don't know about this. So, um, but I mean, eventually once you started coming to the church, you, you spend a little bit of time around Katie, it's over. That's just <laughs> the way it is, man. It was like, it's over. I'm sorry. All right, God, I'll ask her out. Whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about Pastor Kevin and Katie coming in. The relationship that we have mm. with Pastor Greg and Liz. Uh, Pastor Greg's been, I mean, he's been yeah. a mentor to me yeah. since I was 20. I came on staff at 20. 
And so he has uh, believed in and called out giftings in me that nobody else saw. Yeah, I would nobody have never pursued yeah. otherwise. And, um, and I have a lot of confidence in his walk with God. So as he has called things out of me, I've been able to put that pressure back on God and say, okay, God, if, if this is what you want us to do, we'll do it. I am convinced we have the right lead pastor. Kevin Robinson is a man of God and I love dearly. I want to see him succeed. This transition is not something we would have personally sought out. No, this is not all. a position we would have ever personally sought out. So we're, no. the pressure, we really just put that back on God and say, God, we, are, we just want to put our yes on the table for whatever you have. Is the opportunity even greater for us to go outside these walls? Absolutely. We've got some incredible staff here that do a phenomenal job. I get to do all the fun stuff of planning sets and leading a team of about 60 musicians, including my husband here. I play bass uh, on the worship team and I also get to band lead as well. So I get to be uh, a voice behind the scenes on Sundays. I'm with the Discovery Kids, so I'm the leader of um, the Littles. In our preschools, they start off in the playland. Of course, that's the big area with, um, it's a mega, uh, like McDonald's playground. And then we go from there and then we go and do our lesson. We do our dancing, we do our um, activities and they love it. And then of course they love to take home their craft that they made to their parents and then they can share the story to their parents. Babies, I don't know why, they, they have to have like, that stimulation of the TV in front of them, you know what I mean? But like, give them Jesus, you know? Uh, so Connections Pastor here at Foothills, uh, what that kind of means is that I'm the one that helps get everyone connect. Um, so whether that's coming through the doors on a Sunday morning um, through our guest experience team, or whether that's getting you involved um, with a volunteer opportunity or with small groups or whatever that kind of looks like, I'm kind of helping everyone get in, get involved and uh, just become a part of Foothills. Uh, I had a lot of experience in, uh, in the business world and when I came to Foothills, Foothills was growing just by leaps and bounds. Uh, we were having trouble keeping track of people, who was who, uh, 20, 30, 40 new people a week, uh, people getting saved, people and, and just, just trying to find homes for everybody, trying to find out where people were, getting information. After about the third week, Brian said to me, he says, you know, you know something about this, right? And I said, yeah, it's customer service, sure. So he said, can you help us with this? So I sat down with him week after week after week and we started going through the mechanics of how do you, how do you take care of these people that God's sending you? I mean, what, you know, this is, this is amazing. There's a, there's a movement going on here and I was part of it. Mostly I serve in database management um, and staff support. So just taking care of making sure that information from our first time guests is entered properly. Um, that those people are being followed up with by our staff members and pastors. Running reports in our database for our administration team and our pastors to help them like gauge help of their ministries. A lot of the time stuff will break when you don't. Something breaks on a Sunday, you've got to fix it on a Sunday. Or, you know, there's there's a lot of hoops when you have this size of a building, you know, that you have to jump through. You have the fire marshal. You know, everything has to be to the T with the fire marshal. You know, there's there's a lot of systems in a building this size. There's burglar, there's fire, there's so you know, it can get, you know, a little overwhelming, but we like to keep it try to keep it simple and just make sure everything's functioning day to day. I was actually dating Mel and uh, she had asked me, um, hey, would you come volunteer with me on a Sunday night with the uh, students? I was like, huh, okay, yeah, absolutely, because I, I got a love for young people and, and students, and so when she asked me to visit FSM, I was like, yeah, I'll definitely come hang out with you. I've just always loved being a part of the church and serving in the church and, you know, sh pointing others to Christ as well, so. The church I was previously a part of, I actually was the associate pastor there. It was kind of great when we had opportunity, um, there was a opening here and the student ministry opened up for us and then we started serving there and ended up becoming the lead pastors there. So it's been great. Yep. 
one of the things I really liked about Phil's, like I said, I grew up traditional Southern Baptist, and I was used to being, you know, seeing people baptized, but it was almost always a youth or younger. We don't see that here at Foothills. I mean, we see plenty of youth and plenty of younger people baptized, but we see people 60s, 70s, you know, we see all kind of people. I got baptized here. My wife got baptized here. My daughter got baptized here. My grandson got baptized here. Our youngest son, Tyler, he was the first one that was baptized at Foothills. Some of our foster children have been baptized here. We had a party in the pasture and we set up a swimming pool out there and we did baptisms. I got to baptize my daughter out there. This guy who's playing guitar on the team, who's playing lead guitar, he, uh, his wife like comes up to me and she, she says, He's, he's gonna get baptized, he's gonna get baptized today. Every time somebody's baptized, it's just so wonderful. Those are the memorable things really for me, the altar baptism services and all the people, parents baptizing their kids and kids baptizing their parents and people baptizing friends. And That's a lot of fun, but every time somebody's baptized, it's just so wonderful and exciting, meaningful to me. To, to see the change. And I've been, had the honor to witness so many changes. I actually got baptized on Father's Day um, one year. So it was just like the Lord really just redeeming that, saying, I'm your father. I'm your true father. When it came time to watch the baptisms and we're our kids in there like throw a party, they are cheering so loud because I said, listen, let me tell you, the Bible tells us that when somebody gives their life to Christ, angels in heaven throw a party. So let's party in here right now. They are so loud celebrating baptisms. Half of them, they don't know because they're kids, but boy, when they see somebody that they know up there, they're going, she was just sitting next to me. And they're all screaming and clapping. And this one kid said one time, look, there goes my dad. One day, Greg was preaching on risk and we, bat we saw God show up and show out. We were going to do a spontaneous baptism service, which we had never done one before. There was a little plastic swimming pool in the front when you came in and people were looking at that like, you know, what what is it? They were thinking, this is going to be a little embarrassing if we get ready to do the spontaneous baptism and the whole, the whole message is about baptism, the whole day is about baptism and nobody gets baptized. And then Greg talked about baptism and why we're doing it and he said, I know we didn't announce this, but anybody that, you know, would like to be baptized, we can do it this morning. And the first guy that did that was a retired Lieutenant Colonel, um, Bill was his name. He gets up, runs down the aisle, Greg's on stage preaching and he- I'm going into this, the importance of baptism. Here's why we need to be baptisms. And I didn't even get, I was, didn't even get to the amen yet. This guy in the middle of the service just runs down and decided he was ready to be baptized. He got up and ran to the front. I see this guy <laughs> running, running. And he hopped in that swimming pool. Jumps in the swimming pool. The guy jumps in the pool, jumps in the above ground pool we had sitting at center stage. He, he, he literally jumps into the pool. I mean, he, <laughs> he jumps into the pool. You know, with all his clothes on. Fully dressed. I mean, phone in his pocket. And his cell phone and everything got in that water. He's got a cell phone on, he's got everything. He doesn't even, he didn't even care. He was just like, God got a hold of his heart and he jumps in a pool, splashes water over. And it was, it was just like a, a, a work of God seeing that, you know, and he was baptized before Greg could even get all the explanation out. And uh, Greg said, hey, can I get one of you guys to come baptize this guy? And so we did and that started the day that was just, I'm thinking, we looked at each other and go, this is going to be an amazing day. If this happened at 8 o'clock in the morning with this guy, because he was like, like I say, super conservative, we ended up baptizing over 100 people that day, just spontaneously. It was amazing. After that, more and more people came to be baptized. I kind of remember that because that was our first indoor baptism. Yeah, yeah. Some of the stories that people would tell me about their life before Foothills, and then I'm sitting there watching them get baptized. It's Every time we have baptism, it's just the best day for me. I hope one day my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren get baptized here and that they come to the same experience that we did, which is to know the Lord is to love Him, and to love Him is to live the life that He's, you know, given us the opportunity to have.
Um, one of the things that happened to us years back, uh, Greg had went and visited another pastor and Greg came home from that vacation and, and uh, he said, he was asked a question, if Foothills closed its doors, would Foothills be missed? Would our community miss Foothills? And from that point on, we, we started strategically changing things, started taking the church outside these walls and got partners and did Project Reach and went to the community and, and on and on. And then um, that heartbeat's been here all along. Um, and then when we hired Sinead Williams as our outreach director, it was like throwing a log on the fire. It just has erupted. When I started, I went around meeting our partners and talking to city officials, the mayors and city administrators. They all had the same story. That when Foothills volunteers come out, it's a different kind of ball game. That Foothills volunteers are present. You have to give them real work to do because whatever you give them, they're gonna do it so quickly that if you don't fill up their time, it's not like other volunteers. You know that when Foothills shows up, the job is gonna get done and it's gonna be done well. In this area, I don't know if there's any other churches that do that on a regular basis, but when we first started doing that, it was like the community was like, wow, you're gonna uh, come and clean out all the school buses, or you're gonna come and paint these buildings, and they were just amazed that, you know, all and these we had people were, that yeah. That actually served, you know, the community and not just within the walls of the church. We have a, a group that goes to Kentucky on a regular basis to help in some of the uh, communities that, you know, that are less fortunate enough. We also help the, uh, the nonprofits in the community. There's a lot of effort being put out by a lot of people who are not Christians, who are not the faith based, but who have a good heart and, and God uses that. I think I've experienced some cool moments where um, people have, have kind of been on the receiving end of some of our volunteers serving and, and different, you know, various aspects of outreach. And they're just kind of blown away because um, Foothills people are not the typical church crowd that maybe they've experienced. We're also passionate about not just being um, a church that's ready to include people when they show up. We want to get outside of the walls, and so um, we're passionate about partnering with areas that God's already working with people in the community. Most of the people who are part of Foothills Church are also part of something else because they believe that it's not just about Sunday, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of the week, and that happens through the community organizations. We're not trying to replicate what's going on out there, we're just trying to support what goes on. And when I went to Pastor Greg in 2015, I was really nervous to go to him and say, hey, you're Foothills Community Church, there's a crisis in our community, we have no foster parents, we have no adoptive families, um, the church is missing in this kind of whole missions. And Greg literally leaned over the desk and said, what can we do? How can we help? And it's been so beautiful to see that we have. And Falls Tree Faithfully wasn't born back then, but without a, the support of Foothills Church, we would have never gotten off the ground. We have seen so many foster children find family here and family members at this church and been exposed to the love of Jesus through sun sports and showing up here on Sundays and coming to Fostering Faithfully support group here. It's not just about coming to church. We are the church. This building is not the church. So when the, the church, us, the people catch on the vision of helping people find, not just find Jesus, but how do we follow him? That's what Foothills does well, the second part of our mission statement of following. We exist to help people find and follow Jesus. We're gonna do everything we can to get that vision moving forward and we'll cut anything else out that would distract us from that vision. That's where our focus is on reaching people for Christ. Part of the challenges of being a church for your community, the community is bigger than just the walls of this church. I think that for the last 25 years, Foothills has equated evangelism to care. Pastor Bill always says, on time and unrelenting care is what we're about here. We fell in love with the pastors even before we knew what Foothills Church and people were, you know? And uh, then we come to the, to the Sunday service and uh, we look outside and I tell, I, I tell Ramonita, because I have met some of the pastors, I say, uh, so-and-so is a pastor, but he's greeting people. And that's a pastor too, and he's greeting people. And uh, she looks at me and says, they're not pastors. I mean, they're probably greeters, you know what I mean? I said, no, babe. 
that's our lead pastor. Pastor Kevin is greeting. Look at Pastor Greg. They were at the door greeting people, welcoming them. I have never seen that. And to for them to see that as, as part of serving the church, it's, it's, it's amazing. We were very intentional about creating environments for people to be welcomed and valued. We were very intentional about the first time guests. We followed up, we connected them with God, connected them with others. I've had so many stories of people that are like, the reason that I came to church over and over again is because I got greeted in the parking lot. I felt like they loved me, they cared about me. A lot of people talk about pastors and the pastor and the pastor, and they forget to mention the pastor's wife. And for me, when I see Liz, the, the passion, the love, that she has um, for her calling to work with the children, the children's ministry that she runs, the way she loves these kids. And that's, that's a job that not everybody can do. She went to my house the day we were moving. Um, and I, I only saw her like three times at that. And she started putting boxes away. I mean, she got in the kitchen and she started putting dishes away. And I'm like, who does this? Mm -hmm. And even Pastor Greg, he was picking yes, you know, he was. He helped us boxes, move. Mm -hmm. and you don't see that a lot. You don't. Mm -hmm. And also, um, Pastor Kevin's wife, Katie, Katie. Mm -hmm. she loves the youth. So mm -hmm. I observe. They have convinced me of the fact that they really love what they do. Amen. That's what this world is supposed to be about us getting together and like showing Jesus. And I think Foothills is just doing that. And so like, um, I love being part of it. I mean, I do have a brother that's homeless. So I know like when he walked into the door one day and they just showered him like with, hey, here's a bathroom, like let's get you washed up or whatever, you know? And it wasn't just for my brother, it's for like, you know, anyone. So I, I just think, um, the community does get a lot from Foothills. And uh, th there, there are many stories like that, you know, where, where people, uh, God uses this church, you know, to, to impact people's lives, to, to point them to Jesus. And it ain't always pretty, it ain't, you know, raising my hand or standing up during a service. Yeah, one thing that Greg used to say was that the cleaning staff would find empty bottles of alcohol in the trash. And most people would like, oh, that's bad in the church. No, that's good. We're bringing in the, the people who need it, you know. As Jesus said, he came to, he came to save the lost, you know. You don't have to clean yourself up to come here. Yes. People would come um, just the way they are. And we'd meet people where they are. And I look back and I think about my personal life and thinking about you know, the divorce, or thinking about the addiction, alcohol, drugs, I think about the blended family. And, and I, then I think about scripture. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our trouble so that we can comfort others in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. And that's the authenticity that I think people experience. For a lot of churches, <clears throat> I think they get started with the right values. You know, they start, hey, we're going to reach our community for Christ. But something shifts at some point. There has to have been a point where somebody, somebody said, you know what? We've reached enough new people. Let's focus on ourselves. Because that's the only explanation. So for us, just saying there are more people that need to be reached. There are people who don't have a relationship with Jesus. There are people who are broken. There are people who are lost. I always say, and many others say this too, that the people who are the most important people at Foothills are the people that aren't quite here yet. I say the people that haven't come over that curb, they're on their way, the Holy Spirit's sending them. We don't know them, but they're more important than the people that are here. And so when you truly care for somebody, whether it's in the community, whether it's the people coming through the doors, um, whether it's even people coming off the street during the week, when people know that you care, um, they're gonna be around for a lot longer. The dynamic changes because of the structure, because of the lobby size, for example, 
but the heartbeat of who we are never changed. There's some churches I've walked into where it was just like, you walked in as a stranger, you came out as a stranger, but not here. I want Foothills Church to continue in the vision of helping people find out who Jesus is and teaching them how to follow Jesus because that is the mission of this church. And I know that God can use the leadership of this church to reach more people. If there's a lost soul out there, I pray that God will use them. Use the church to reach them. We've tried to, we've tried to guard against turning inward. And we've always tried to be outward focused. We want it to make a difference in the community. We've gone through all sorts of economic upturns, downturns, expansion, contraction, all, all the various things that you might experience. A tornado came through a few years ago. We would get some breaking news. Though. Images from upstate South Carolina show the destruction the area is coping with after a night of severe storms. Officials believe the suspected tornado touched down around 3.30 right in the middle of the night while everyone was sleeping. The timing of these storms is what made them especially dangerous. Homes were destroyed and others may have found the There is just a lot of debris everywhere so it's not safe for people to be out and about right now. Literally the first people we saw were people from Foothills coming to help us, be in the hands and feet of Jesus. Every spot that we went to, people would go, are you guys Foothills Church? We know that you're gonna help. We know that you're here for us. And that's what makes an impact on a community. That's what this world is supposed to be about. Is the opportunity even greater for us to go outside these walls? Absolutely. Expanding to Pendleton, adding Espanol. When we first came in, we realized that Pendleton is a, a community that's very historical. What we have done is just gone to all the city officials and we've just said, you know, hey, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. How can we serve you? The Pendleton police chief, he just sat back in his chair and he said, I've been here for 18 months. I've never had a faith community ask me that question. It's cool to kind of break that mold and mm -hmm. have people view the body of the church a little differently mm -hmm. and just feel like, okay, this maybe this is how it's supposed to be. Well, we have heard that from within the community already. Is like, there's nobody else like you. We're so glad you're in town because um, we've been looking for a church like this. And so it's really neat to see how we, as Foothills Pendleton, are able to be the puzzle piece that was missing from that community. Foothills es Español, it's, it's something very interesting. One of the things we said from the beginning was, we're not launching a church in Foothills. We're actually extending the Foothills vision into another language so they could find and follow Jesus, but also educating our American church of what Hispanics are. One of the things that, that we need to be clear is our community to begin with, our, our nature in the community is we are suspect of everyone and we will never go into a place that we are not sure that it's a secure place to go to. You have to understand most of the Latin American places have been on, ruled by others for many, many years because we had we were conquered or because the systems put us always under the submission of another country. So part of that is a lot of Hispanics believe if even if they come, they're not going to be welcome because they don't welcome people that look like me. You see what I mean? So I think one of the first jobs I told the pastors and, and that we've done and that we're doing right now is can we tell the community that this is a safe place, that not only you're gonna come, but we're gonna embrace you, and you're not gonna be that, that little Hispanic that we're helping sit on the corner, but you're gonna be part of the church. You are Foothills. Here's what I tell people. Never forget what it felt like to be lost. Because when you forget what it felt like to be out there without Christ, without hope, without purpose, then you're, you, you will lose mission. So for me, I, I it's still vividly remember those feelings. And so I don't and I don't want anybody else to experience that.
We've yeah. said that multiple times. It is just a community uh, that, that embraces each other, no yeah. matter what our backgrounds are, no matter what we've done in our past. Yeah. We're all misfits that have oh been gosh, just yeah. wrecked by the love of Jesus. Yes. And, and to know that the person sitting across from you or next to you on the aisle is in the exact same boat, <laughs> there's just this camaraderie that exists yeah. here, you know? You know, me being Hispanic, like I can see people take, like how they're fearful and I would like to see them grow and be able to have trust in us to be out there for them because there's one God, you know? So many people are coming in with so many stories represented. Jesus Christ loves not just people in Oconee County, he loves people in Haiti and Africa and all over the world. All kinds of people come to this church and you know, you get to step out of your own comfort zone and meet people who are different and you can learn from them a lot. Even though we are different people, we all need the same thing, which same is right. God. The thing about Foothills is you could come today and we have a place for you to start making a difference and using your purpose today. At one of the churches that I was at before, they said, you will never be a pastor. You just don't have what it takes. When we came here to Foothills, they said, you're gonna be a pastor. You have what it takes. That is one of the good things about Foothills. It's honestly a place where you can come with your passions and your hobbies and your talents, and they will put you to work serving God. It's keeping the main thing the main thing. Helping people find and follow Jesus is the main thing. You, you'll have a place in our church. You won't feel that way. Give us a chance. We have leadership that truly desire for God's will to be done. And they, to me, it's very relatable. They're very real. I love that everyone feels accepted here. There's not a click of this type of people who attend Foothills. There's not the click of tradition, but it's biblical. And we follow biblical truths and the Bible's preached here. Because that's the representation that we've been given. That's the vision that we've been given, is to represent the love of the Lord. And that is, you know, people who are of all stripes, all backgrounds, all varieties, with all sorts of stories. You can tell the like sincerity of people and the genuine just love for the Lord. That's what has got us this far. We want you to come as you are, but then you experience God and God will work on your heart. We love people, we love our community, we love Jesus and want to bring all those things together here. And that's the good news. It's, it's who Jesus is, that you're loved by Him that He has a better life for you. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is His church. He wants to do greater things than we can imagine. We as a church are not thinking of ourselves. We're thinking of what Christ would want the church to be. I think it's probably our greatest time because this is a dark window of time for the world. And that's when the light will shine its brightest. The leadership here has always stayed committed to the truth that we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. Helping people find and follow Jesus. Find and follow Jesus. Find and follow. Find and follow. Find and follow Jesus. You know, helping people find and follow Jesus. I mean, that's the, right. the goal of our church. It is helping people find and follow Jesus. The vision hasn't changed, had deviated. That's where we keep our focus. And that's what I love most about Foothills Church. Is we're consistent with that and it's authentic. It's not just something, it's not a strategy. It's, it's just who we are. And if you have to think about it, it's not real. Um, the real measure, I think, of success of any church is, you know, just fulfilling the Great Commission. And that's what we want to, that's what we want to keep doing. That's what's been our focus the whole time. So it's basically is helping people find out who Jesus is and then live their life following Jesus. And I never want that to ever stop happening here at Foothills Church. What makes Pastor Greg such a dynamic leader? Everything. <laughs> Why do you ask me these really tough questions? This guy here, my prince, loves Jesus with a passion that goes beyond anything that anybody could ever understand. He cares so deeply. And he simply wants people to have what he has. Um, what makes him a dynamic leader? He's real. He's, um, 
This is my world. I'd follow him anywhere. And I know the people of Foothills would do the same thing because they know he's a man of God. He's a man of his word, so I love you. Thank you. Well, you can tell by her passion of her Jesus, her church, those kids that she leads, um, the impact that Liz has. I, I said this when we were getting ready to go through our succession plan that I'm the easy one to replace. She's the hard one to replace. Um, there's, there's nobody that works harder at Foothills, puts in more hours, that cares more deeply, and that has a heart that is bigger than the world than my darling wife. And she, she lives it. I mean, she doesn't matter where she's at. She's at, you know, at a, in a line at the, at the grocery store. She's gonna, she has an opportunity. She's gonna invite somebody to church, tell them about Jesus. That's what she does. That's who she is. And uh, we're very fortunate to have someone as, you know, not just as good at what she does, because she does what she does great, but with the heart she does it with. And I think that's what makes it special.